Get pumped, get psyched. It's the Wager Pager podcast with Chris Rogers and Brock Landers. Ooh, what's up, guys? And welcome back to the Wager Pager podcast. You guys know what we do. We talk sports gambling, make picks, and conduct must-hear interviews with some of the sharpest minds in the sports betting industry. I'm your host, Chris Rogers. You can follow me on Twitter at WagerPagerChris. And please follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at The Wager Pager. This is episode one of our new pandemic series, recording live from North Jersey Studios. That's right. We're coming to you from the mecca of sports gambling, our home state of New Jersey that won the Supreme Court battle and made the regulation of sports betting all possible. We got a great show for you guys this week. We are talking about The Last Dance, Chicago Bulls' Michael Jordan documentary that is currently blowing everybody's mind. We are super excited to have former Chicago Bulls beat writer Melissa Isaacson joining us today to talk covering Michael Jordan and the 90s Bulls and get her thoughts on The Last Dance documentary in which she herself makes an appearance in. But first, let me introduce my co-host, one of the sharpest gamblers I know, my guy with 18 New Jersey betting outs and someone who knows his way around the sports book. Here he is, the Dennis Rodman of gambling Twitter that never needs a vacation, Brock Landers. What's going on, Chris? Quite an introduction to be compared to Dennis Rodman. A uh, probably like eight year old me would really love that. Hey, the worm, man. I don't know if you saw episode uh, three, I guess was the one that was uh, completely focused on Rodman. Uh, just epic stuff, man. All four episodes so far of The Last Dance. I know you've been following. What do you think so far? It's been everything I was expecting, plus more. Uh, they did a really good job on it. And uh, I think it's like the perfect thing that we were able to get through all this crazy pandemic stuff. Because uh, I was, I've been looking forward to this thing since I saw that first trailer like, like two years ago or whatever that was. Um, but yeah, thank God they bumped it up because it gives me something to look forward to every Sunday. Uh, after dinner something cool to watch and I've been blown away every episode is better than the next I thought the first two were great to kind of set the mood and last week's were even better I felt how about you yeah man just tremendous content that they're putting out here Uh, like you said we got no sports nothing to gamble on so it's just like that weekly thing everyone's looking forward to watching just uh, you know the interviews have been great. I think the idea with the iPad getting uh, people's reactions live on camera has has been awesome. Um, obviously, the footage, a lot of the montages they've been doing with uh, with music and stuff with Jordan. I like how they bounce back and forth between storylines. They're kind of telling yes. Jordan's story and the story of the '98 Bulls all at once. Yes. Yeah, it just works, man, and it's like it's just filling that need right now that everyone has. I thought even the uh, the Phil Jackson stuff was pretty good in, uh, I think it was episode four last week. Like, they had that footage of him coaching, uh, you know, in Belize, right? Or whatever that was, wherever that was. And it was, like, shocking. I was like, I've never seen footage of that. I've never seen anything other than, like, you know, NBA-type footage from Phil. Yeah, the footage has been incredible, man. You also uh, saw some shots of deadhead Phil there talking about taking acid in the 70s and stuff. <laughs> that picture was amazing. Him in the cab, That I'm not even like a Phil Jackson fan, but I would wear that on a t-shirt, definitely. Oh, I got my Phil Jackson stash working right here. <laughs> uh, speaking of t-shirts, we're repping for our boy Jeff Sheesby. Got the old man who bets uh, merch right here. That reminds me, we're going to be coming out with some merch soon. Wager Pager t-shirts, stickers, mugs, who knows? We should be sipping on some coffee soon, Pager style. Nice, nice. Can't wait for that. Yeah, uh, Jeff's been uh, enjoying some good food, though. I see he's been going to like pivoting to the, the cooking aspect on, uh, on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. Everyone's out here just uh, scrambling to put out content here under pandemic. I believe uh, tonight's episodes are going to focus on Kobe Bryant. And then the dream team, um, like I said, today's guest, Melissa Isaacson, does appear herself in, in the documentary in a later episode. We're going to talk to her a little bit about uh, MJ's gambling and his betting habits back then in the 90s. So it should oh, be fun, man. That. Yeah, that should be some good stuff. Right on. So uh, without further ado, let's get right into it, guys. Uh, we got our interview coming up next with Melissa Isaacson, former beat writer for the Chicago Bulls in the 90s. Get pumped. Get psyched. It's the Wager Pager Podcast. We love betting on sports here at the Wager Pager Podcast, but that's not all we bet on. Predicted.org is the stock market for politics. 
you can make real money predictions on everything from the 2020 Democratic vice presidential choice, congressional actions, Trump administration policies, and much, much more. More than 200 markets are live at any point with new markets going up every weekday. Predicted.org is headquartered in Washington, D.C. and legal in all 50 states for any U.S. citizen who is 18 years of age or older. Log on to Predicted.org slash promo slash wager20. That's Predicted.org slash promo slash wager20. Think you know politics? Put your money where your mouth is. Be sure to visit Predicted.org today. All right, guys, if you've been binge watching The Last Dance like we have, then you're probably going to love hearing from our next guest who makes an appearance in the documentary herself. She is the former Chicago Bulls beat writer and columnist for the Chicago Tribune during all six of the Bulls championships in the 90s. She's an award-winning journalist, author, and current lecturer at Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism. Here she is, Melissa Isaacson. You guys can follow Melissa on Twitter at MK Isaacson. Hello, Melissa. Welcome to the Wager Pager. Hi, guys. How are you? We're good. So glad to get you on here and talk to us. We can't wait for uh, tonight's episode. And so far, it's been so great. So to be able to speak with somebody that was actually there is really awesome. Oh, I'm excited, too, actually, because I haven't seen it. It seems like a lot of people got a preview. And uh, I didn't, um, mostly probably because I wasn't writing anything about it. I didn't really ask. So I'm curious too, but I've, and I've enjoyed it as, you know, any fan would, I've really enjoyed it a lot. Right on. We are so excited to have someone such as yourself, who's had the opportunity to have such exclusive access to Michael Jordan and the Bulls, especially back then during the nineties. Um, we know that you appear yourself in the documentary. Do you know which episode that you appear in? Have you seen it? And have you seen any of the other ones that haven't aired yet? <laughs> Yeah, I haven't. Um, I was told episode six, so I guess it would be the second episode tonight. Um, Great time. And yeah, I felt like, weirdly, I when they interviewed me a year ago, I don't know, maybe I didn't prepare enough, or maybe I was just, I felt like I didn't do a great job, like, uh, remembering exact details since then. So that's my excuse if I, if I sound uh, a little unsure of myself. Tonight. I have no idea how I sound. You know, you're always like nervous about that kind of stuff because I'm not a TV person you know I'm a writer obviously but I'm usually pretty un, uh, pretty comfortable on camera but I since that interview I have remembered more you know it sort of comes rushing back when you yeah. see it and when you you know everybody's talking about it um, the things I remember are odd you know I remember uh, you know details that involve things that you know maybe nobody else would necessarily have cared about then but, you know, are sort of interesting in the whole scheme of things. Well, I'm glad we got you here <laughs> then today. Uh, we can maybe expand on some of that experience that you talked about in the documentary. Before we get uh, started here and rolling, why don't you, uh, for some of the listeners who may not be sure, what does a beat reporter do and how much access do you actually have to the team? Yeah, well, I was the principal beat writer uh, covering the Bulls uh, for four years, starting in 1991. I um, was in 90 for their first championship. I was along during the playoffs writing sidebars, which are, you know, the little stories kind of that accompany the main stories. And then the next four years, I was principally responsible for every day, everything they did, every practice, every game, um, traveling, uh, Sam Smith was the beat writer before that. He wrote a best-selling book, uh, Jordan Rules, that got an awful lot of attention, and the Tribune thought made it more difficult for him to cover the team as the beat writer. So he became the uh, NBA writer and kind of the Bulls writer at large, and I became the beat writer, um, you know, which is my great fortune. I was in my late 20s, and I had, you know, I had been a sports writer for eight, 10 years and I had covered other beats, but this was obviously huge, kind of landed in my lap a day, a year after I got to the Tribune. I'm from Chicago. So yeah, it's, it was a great ride. And then um, I had my first child, came back and covered the Chicago Bears as the principal beat writer. And I, um, but during the off season back then, it wasn't as much a full-time all year job to cover uh, an NFL team. So I would join in, you know, onto the Bulls uh, after the Bears were over, 
which um, was usually early <laughs> and going very far back in the mid nineties. <laughs> um, and I would, you know, cover a lot of bull stuff then and, and during the playoffs and stuff. So I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was around them. Wow. What a, what an incredible opportunity. Um, like how early on did you realize that you were like dealing with something really special here? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's easy to say, uh, you know, oh yeah, you know, we realize a lot of times when you're younger, you don't, you know, it, when it takes many years to go by to really have perspective, but my God, it was Michael Jordan. I mean, of course we knew what we were dealing with. And of course I knew, uh, there was no question that he was the, the best player in the NBA. And many of us in our experience, the greatest player we'd ever seen. And so I had no reason to think that anybody in my lifetime would be, you know, exponentially better. So I, I absolutely knew that it was a blessing to, to watch every night. You know, it was still a job. It was still a lot of work. But sitting there and watching somebody who I knew was in his prime, um, and had great access to him and to this team that we knew was very special, if not one of the best ever. Um, absolutely, I appreciated it and thought it was great and tried to digest it as much as I could. I, I totally realized I was lucky, for sure. So, Melissa, you said that you were there for the first championship. Uh, just to, you know, in right now in the documentary, we pretty much are at that point. The first championship is kind of where we left off from last week. We're building eventually up to the retirement the first time around. How shocking was that as you were covering uh, the Bulls those years? Yeah, you know, that's it, interesting you're asking now because, again, as I'm trying to revive, you know, my memory for, for everything that was going on, I have been looking at a lot of old stories, and um, there was a lot of signals. There were a lot of signs. I'm not sure – how carefully uh, the documentary or how closely, you know, they're, they're going to follow every single thing. But there was a time um, when Michael was, it was in um, January that he, I, I, I feel like it was a, a one-on-one -on -one interview with me. I could be wrong. Um, but when he talked about being really tired and being really um, how just worn out by the whole thing, and I, I kind of called up the story just so I could find it, but he was very cranky. You know, it was kind of the dog days, uh, January 31st, 1993. And the rest of the team was getting annoyed with him. He had just had a game in which he, he shot, 40, he had 49 shots, which was a career high <laughs> and a lot of shots. And it was seven more than the rest of the starting lineup combined. And they had just lost to Orlando. And it was, the you know, like I said, it was just the dog days of the, you know, the season, there was grumbling afterward. Pippen was, um, was, was being underpaid, was not happy with his contract. Horace was, clearly they weren't making any moves to keep him in free agency. And so everybody was grumbling that it was going back to the old days when Michael was taking over and he was being selfish and he was just pissed, you know? And so he, he said to me, um, I just haven't been used to this pressure because in the past I've had good responses at the end of games. He was also missing some shots in the second half. His shooting percentage is really low. And that just hadn't happened before. And he said, I've had some games in the past where I've had to take over, but because of some of the ups and downs this season, I've been looked to carry the load a little bit more. And our play has been so erratic. It's been easy to spot um, my aggressiveness at the end of the games. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm feeling so bad. It's not just that I'm tired. It's that I'm forced to take a lot of shots I really haven't been taking, and it wears you down. And the real thing that uh, – the real kill, uh, telling quote that he had was that um, he said – I said that as, as among his teammates, as the talk turns more often to playing time contracts and their future rather than the game, it has him worrying. And he said it's human nature that when success comes around, everybody's fat, everybody's independent – when before everyone was supportive and connected and tight, all championship teams go that way, but that's going to be the ultimate destruction of this team. And so that was kind of the first in January of thinking that, um, that, you know, he might not be around forever. Uh, and then he said something about, he actually said that, that, um, that he may not want to be there forever. You know, he kept saying, as long as I'm here, that's my role. Um, you know, a lot of people can't deal with being successful. It becomes a greed thing. They want to have it all when they can't, they want to jump ship. They want to go somewhere else. 
Um, so he just started, you know, it just started becoming not fun. And then of course, you know, his father was killed and, um, and then for sure you got the feeling that, that, you know, that he might not want to come back. And indeed that's, I think what drove him out. Yeah. I mean, but was there ever any type of, you know, like baseball, like how, how crazy yeah. was that? Like when, when that happened, like, you know, you might think, all right, maybe he's going to take some time off, go play for another franchise. Maybe he doesn't want to play here anymore or something like that. But to switch sports like that mid prime. Yeah, no, I'm not going to sit here and say it wasn't shocking because it definitely was. Um, you know, those of us who talked to Michael a lot knew that growing up, he loved baseball. He loved NASCAR. He really, really loved baseball. Him and his father really bonded over baseball. Um, you know, the more he got into baseball, the more we found out that it was more than just loving it. He always thought that he could really play. Uh, his father and he bonded over the Braves. They loved the Braves. Um, his father's favorite t- favorite player, though, was Roberto Clemente. I mean, he talked about that stuff. You knew he loved it. He he just always wanted a new challenge. I think, you know, as much as anything, that drove him to it. Um, and then he just felt like without his dad, I, I don't know, I got the feeling somehow that he was almost running away, kind of, kind of running away from his grief, which of course we know is impossible. You know, you, it's going to follow you. And indeed, when I interviewed him in Birmingham, when he was playing for the Barons, um, he, he talked to me about, about watching TV in his hotel room and crying. Um, it was a Wesley Snipes movie and the character had lost his father and he said he just couldn't stop crying. And so I, at that time, I felt like he, baseball was not maybe going to, you know, be the thing for him, that it was just him kind of trying to find, uh, a bonding place for him and his dad that they always loved, you know, his dad always thought he was a great baseball player. Maybe that's what he was trying to find. And he just didn't, he just, uh, he didn't really find it there. I think he had moments where he really enjoyed it. He enjoyed getting away from, um, from the grind. He liked hanging out with the young baseball players and they would play pickup basketball, which, you know, when did he ever get a chance to do that? They literally would just stop at some park and play pickup basketball. So he had a good time with that, but you know, at his age, getting back on the bus and stuff, it just wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna keep. So, um, and then sports illustrated had that cover, that said, you know, bag it, Michael, you know, he can't hit the curveball, which is pretty tough thing to do is hit, you know, professional baseball pitchers curveball for, uh, for anyone. And he did get better in baseball, but um, I think that also really pissed him off and made him more, you know, just weary because it was, he wasn't used to criticism. He wasn't used to failure. Wow. Uh, tremendous stuff here, guys, on the Wager Pager podcast from Melissa Isaacson. You guys can follow her on Twitter at MK Isaacson. Melissa, I know you wrote a book about this same exact time period that we're referring to now, uh, Transition Game, an inside look at the Chicago Bulls. So after finishing all the research that you did and writing the book, did you ever have a, a feeling that he, he would be eventually coming back to basketball? Um, you know, I think we all kept asking. I mean, we all kept asking that question aloud um, because clearly he had much more to give. Uh, baseball wasn't really working out. Uh, the Bulls didn't win without him. And although they played really, really well and better than anyone thought, um, you knew that, you know, if he came back, there'd be a very good chance uh, for them to win more championships. So the question was asked constantly. He also would come back without anybody's knowledge. We didn't know at the time. Um, He would kind of sneak into the Birdo Center where they practiced, and he would fool around and shoot a little bit and talk to the team a little bit. And he clearly missed it. There was no question. Um, You know, when he talked to me about playing pickup, you know, there was no question how much he loved the game. So it it was – it was, it was it expected that, you know, for sure it's going to happen? No. Was it a shock that when he came back, when he announced it? No, I don't think it was. I think we all kind of had it in the back of our minds. Yeah, coming back, rocking the number 45. I, I remember it vividly. Uh, it was a crazy time period. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's transition over, um, go backwards in time a little bit here. I, I saw an interview that you were in. And you were talking a little, little bit about the, uh, the Bulls mania and you compared it to that of the Beatles mania back right. in the 60s. 
I personally think that uh, like these days, post internet, that people don't even get as famous as they used to pre internet. Can you talk a little bit about the phenomenon of the Bulls and what it was like traveling with the team and you know the crowds and even the attention they would get from opposing players? Yeah, I mean, let's make it clear. It was not. I was a small child during Beatles mania, Beatle mania. Um, so I certainly <laughs> didn't have firsthand uh, knowledge. Although I do remember. I mean, I do remember the Beatles, and of course, seeing clips like we all did of women, you know, girls going crazy. Um, I think that's really interesting, and I think you're right about it. People being almost, you know, because of the mystique, because there weren't a billion pictures from every fan. Um, of Michael Jordan, of the Bulls, that spottings, you know, sightings were still huge. Um, being at the same hotel, you know, it, it, you weren't able to get t-shirts and jerseys with the kind of ease that you could get now. And so anytime you'd see anything like that or be able to have anything like that, it was incredible. Uh, and even traveling with them as we did and being around that was still incredible. You couldn't get into the hotel without, you know, your, your key, you couldn't, um, you had to prove that, that, you know, you were staying at the hotel. But before that, and even in the early 90s, when they would let fans in, everybody would cram in their head, you know, trying to get autographs, then it was starting to get where people were collecting autographs, um, and not just little kids, um, you know, for selling, reselling or whatever. So you could not move in the lobby, you, you know, especially when you would, well, it was anywhere. It was really everywhere. But I remember in New York and we would, um, from the hotel front door to the team bus was probably 20 steps. And I mean, clearing a path, the cops clearing a path to that bus was like a major undertaking to get them to the bus. And the fans surrounded the bus and it felt like it was rocking. I, I mean, I wasn't on the bus, but I remember them saying, and it looked like it, they were rocking the bus that so many people were around it at the time. So it was a big bus, but um, it was that, it was that crazy. And it was that, uh, you know, everywhere they went. And Michael wasn't a guy who, you know, was at the gas station. I mean, he was someone who, if he went shopping at the mall, uh, he would have the mall shut down, you know? And so, there was, there was just a great, great mystique to Michael. And you travel in those days. If I would travel anywhere out of the country, people would say, you're from Chicago, Michael Jordan. And that didn't always happen. But uh, right about that time is when you could be on the Great Wall of China, which I was years later. And, you know, people would still say, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. Um, so it was bigger than anything that, you know, I had experienced or that you could imagine. Wow. Uh, speaking of traveling out of the country, did you get the opportunity to travel with the Dream Team and cover, Michael? I didn't. Um, Sam and another writer from our uh, paper who covered the Olympics uh, were in Barcelona and were in, I think, Monte Carlo where they, um, where they practiced. Um, so no, I was, not, I was not at that Olympics. Certainly before and after. And uh, Michael, Scotty came back um, exhausted and uh, got had ankle surgery that year as well and also came back late. He had surgery at the very end of August. So he was also delayed coming back that season. They had a lot, there was a lot of talk about him coming back um, late in the 96 season, everybody being mad um, or rather the 98 season, I'm sorry, that final last dance season. But back in uh, the year after their third championship, when Michael retired, um, Scotty also was uh, late coming back. He was just exhausted from the Olympics. And there was a lot of criticism then too, and he wasn't pleased with his contract then either. Um, but they, they ended up having an unbelievable season. They won 55 games, should have beaten the Knicks if not for a bad call by Hugh Hollins. And um, Pippen, by a lot of accounts, should have won the MVP that year. Dave, uh, David Robinson won, but he, he was, uh, it was his best season um, as far as being an all-around player. So it was really a, an incredible year right after the Olympics. And a lot of, obviously, there was a lot of talk about that. Melissa, just to switch gears from, you know, Jordan per se, obviously in the documentary, uh, we've been seeing Jerry Krause's involvement with it and kind of the way that the, the documentary is kind of taking us so far in that way uh, as to try to say that, 
you know, he was a major role in why all this kind of just stopped in the end. Uh, what was your role like with Jerry Krause and, you know, past conversations and, and on a daily basis and, you know, kind of how you remember Jerry? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, Jerry obviously isn't here to defend himself. And so right. watching the documentary, um, I'd have friends and even colleagues say, boy, that's a little rough on Jerry. Yeah. Um, but I honestly, the way I remember it, I, you know, it's hard for me to defend him. Um, I know what he would say. I know what he was like. I know the treatment I got from him. Um, you know, I mean, GMs, you know, through the annals of time, don't like beat writers often. We right. write things that they don't like. Uh, he really, really had a deep distrust and dislike for the media for many reasons. And when I came on the beat, he just, I, I didn't feel, you know, like he gave me a chance. I, I didn't really care that much. I, I tried, you know, my best to cover the team and cover him. Um, the way I looked at it is he brought a lot of the animosity from the team onto himself. Um, was it a bonding thing for them after Michael left to all be sort of on the same anti Krauss bandwagon for sure it absolutely brought them together in a lot of ways um but he didn't have to you know watching the documentary and he's on the bus and they're talking about <laughs> the players giving him a hard time and it looked like poor jerry you know and i'm at home screaming get off the bus you know like <laughs> why are you on the bus you know why are you on the seriously plane? i mean i you know and i i quoted people in stories i did on jerry over the years which of course you know explains why he didn't like me in many ways um, but other GMs named GMs, Pat Williams uh, from Orlando said, I told them, get off the plane, get out of the gym, stop being one of the guys. You're not one of the guys. Mm -hmm. And he said it in a really kind of kind way. He liked Jerry. Um, Jerry never spoke to him after that quote in my story, which just tells you something about Jerry. Huh. Um, and it was not, was not mean spirited. It was just kind of a story on why doesn't anybody like this guy? when he's won three titles? Why does he get booed at the ring ceremonies, you know? And so that's what, that's what Pat Williams said, and it's, and it's true. He just forever wanted to be one of the gang, um, but you can't be one of the gang when you're bad-mouthing, you know, the players to their agent, and then the next day you're trying to be their pal. You, you can't do that. So, you know, and then he did look the way he did, so he was an easy mark, and, um, and they took <laughs> advantage of it, you know? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, super fascinating stuff. Uh, I was like, you know, in my preteens to my uh, probably in my 18 years old. So I wasn't really aware of that whole dynamic uh, with Kraus and everything. So it's been one of my favorite parts to follow in the documentary. Um, but speaking of the documentary, I don't know if you've heard, but legendary documentary filmmaker Ken Burns came out this week and he had some harsh criticism about the documentary simply because uh, Jordan is involved in producing it himself and he, he thinks that's not a very uh, fair documentary, uh, you know, sort of uh, out way to lay yeah. it out. But what, what do you feel about that? I mean, all I can say is, you know, I met the director and, um, you know, I, I and the coordinating producer and I thought that they went about it uh, the way they explained it and the way they questioned me in a very professional way. They went through, you know, tons of footage and tons of stories and tape and all kinds of things. Um, Michael seemed intent from everything I heard and everything they told me to present, you know, kind of warts and all. I mean, he said he thought it was going to make him look bad. I'm not sure how much he saw along the way. I didn't get the impression that he had any rights of approval or editing or anything. I don't think he was involved in that end of it. So um, I see where Ken Burns is coming from. Certainly he's Ken Burns. But um, I think uh, seeing Michael reacting the way he did, being interviewed when they showed him other interviews, I don't think that it was scripted, you know, this, now we're going to do this and in part two we're going to do that. Um, so I, and in fact, knowing Michael, I, I think making him look like anything other than what he was uh, would be abhorrent to him. He would hate that. He's a very authentic guy. I mean, you know, his Hall of Fame speech says it all. I, I was one of the few people who actually really liked it because I thought it was totally him. And I don't think he had any regrets whatsoever. And what you see uh, with him being interviewed in his living room is totally him. So um, I'm not sure, you know, what he would have, 
how he would have changed it to make himself look better. I think there, I think he looks as he is. That, that's my take. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think the the reactions that Jordan that you get from Jordan with the iPad, I think that was a brilliant move. You see him yep. in live time, and you know, thirty years later, he still hates Isaiah Thomas and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Uh, Absolutely. Horace, yeah. Horace Grant calling the Pistons straight up bitches, and and you know, it's just it's just great content. It's totally great, and you'll see just from the little clip because I didn't see it, but. Um, when Michael accuses Horace of leaking um, stuff to Sam for the book, Jordan Rules, uh, he was pissed and he was pissed back then. And he still is, you know, and that's that's Michael. Like that's explained so much about him, how competitive he is and how um, and he doesn't drop stuff. And he held grudges throughout his competitive life. And that's what fueled his his competition and his, you know, his. Uh, his performances, he always had to invent things to make himself angry, to make himself be that much more motivated to beat somebody. So all of that you see, you see still in him, which is really cool. Very cool. Um, something we haven't seen so far, at least in the documentary, is the story of Tony Kukoc. I know Brock's a big fan of European basketball players, as am myself. Can you touch on a little bit of the legend of Tony Kukoc, what it was like uh, leading up to him joining the Bulls, and just maybe some unknown stuff about Tony Kukoc? Yeah, I love Tony to this day. He's um, and he's one of the few guys who still, you know, defends Jerry, which good for him because Jerry was very good to him, and he's pretty loyal to Jerry, even though he also has a great relationship with Michael and and, and Scotty. As far as I know, he plays golf with Michael still. Um, but you have to know that, you know, here's this kid from Europe that no one had ever seen. Uh, and all they knew was, again, Jerry just on and on. Jerry just didn't know how to, he just didn't have any tact. So he was constantly talking about this great kid um, who was going to come and be part of the team. And, you know, he's probably better than you, Scotty. And he's, you know, and, you know, he would just, he tried to trash talk and it was stupid. And, they didn't know and they didn't care. And so it made them poor Tony, you know, when they played in the Olympics, Scotty and Michael really tried to take it out on him. Michael or Tony understood. Um, but then Tony gets to town and, and Michael had just retired. Uh, and he was really, really crushed by it because that was part of the reason he wanted to come. He wanted to play with, you know, the greatest player ever. Um, and he couldn't, he could understand English, but he couldn't, speak it very well he, he would take him a while to sort of listen digest and then say what he wanted to and phil was extremely impatient anyway as a lot of coaches veteran coaches were with rookies and young players so he really 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 was tough on tony and you know he gave him a comic book he gave everybody books when they went off to uh you know and on different trips he would give them books he'd pick them out especially for for them and he gave Tony a comic book because he thought he could only look at the pictures. You know, he was really mean and he was really, really tough on him in practice. But Tony, to his credit, and he didn't play much defense, Tony. So that was another reason to pick on him. <laughs> but they speak so highly of him. And, and he, you know, he absolutely on another team would have been a perennial All-Star and uh, was a phenomenal talent. The 6'11", uh, they called him a point forward. They kind of made up that position. But he absolutely could handle the ball like any guard could at six eleven. When could you ever? When would you ever see that? He had his, the softest, sweetest shot you've ever seen. And it was it was very cool. I mean, in the you know in, in sort of the pattern of Michael, would take any big shot without hesitating, and often you know and usually made them. So he was a perfect complement, a perfect complement to that team. And then especially when Michael got back and eventually they came to really, really respect him. But he was a really sweet, sweet guy. And he still is. I, I like him a lot and always have. Yeah. I mean, you brought up a good point saying how it was hard, uh, you know, for him to adapt at first to, to what was going on in Chicago at the time and whatnot. Was there any other players that were kind of like that, that you could just tell when you were at, you know, shoot around or, you know, post game before the game, you could kind of tell that there was just maybe something that, you know, didn't fit in right. Well, um, you know, Michael would pick on guys in practice, uh, you know, to, to kind of toughen them up. And if they didn't fight back, you know, they would get the brunt of it. So he was always tough on the big men, the young guys like Will Perdue and Scott Williams. Um, you know, he'd, I mean, even Bill Cartwright, who wasn't a young guy, you know, he'd end up 
elbowing him in the head and you know probably probably explained uh bill's hoarseness got elbowed in the neck quite a few times throughout his career and probably throughout practice by michael i mean he was very very tough on those young guys and you know oftentimes you kind of felt for him but they generally got tougher through the process. So I don't know. Rodney McRae was a guy I always felt really bad for. He never really fit in. He just mm-hmm. didn't, he just didn't have the temperament for that team. And he didn't play very well when he played with the Bulls. Um, a lot of role players did really, really play well though. Guys like Bobby Hansen, who was a bench player. He was a good college player at Iowa and had cl- some really clutch shots on the playoffs in 92. Um, you know, there was Jojo English. I mean, there was guys that nobody ever really heard of who came in and, uh, and really were strong off the bench. They had a phenomenally underrated but great bench um, throughout all those championships. And that was due to, to Phil, but it was also due to Michael toughening up all those guys in practice. I mean, Scott Williams, Michael was good to Scott because he's from North Carolina and he had a tough time um, with his parents dying. And he, so Michael was pretty pretty nice to him but a lot of the other guys he was he was really hard on yeah super fascinating stuff guys from melissa isaacson here on the wager pager podcast i hope you don't mind if we keep you for just a couple more minutes here melissa um because we would be remiss if we didn't ask a little bit about jordan and his gambling habits we are Mm -hmm. essentially a, a sports betting podcast uh by trade um Let me ask you a little bit about the famous, the infamous now story back in 1993. I know you wrote about it um, after game two versus the Knicks in the Eastern Conference Finals. Michael was allegedly down in Atlantic City. Um, Some eyewitnesses that were apparently like, uh, you know, big time Knicks fans that sit in the front row said they spotted him at at Bally's playing Baccarat at like 2.30 a.m. Michael uh, says he was home by 11 and just being from Jersey, I know it's pretty hard. I mean, no, Michael said he was home by one. I know being from Jersey, it's pretty hard to get from uh, Atlantic City back to New York City in two hours. Just what was your, uh, how do you remember that whole uh, controversy, how that went down? And do you think he was down there gambling all night long? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it was all night long. I thought he admitted over the years that he had been there pretty late. I don't even think that was the the thing. I think it was just that he was there at all. And why would he be there before a big game? And, um, you know, I think, again, it was not one of those things that the Bulls media, at least, thought it was really much of anything. Because here's a guy who would play 72 holes of golf on the off day between playoff games, literally 72 holes, and nobody thought twice about it. He was an incredible competitor. He had almost fuel that adrenaline rush. He liked gambling. Um, He didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Uh, I remember, again, I pulled this quote because I knew you to ask. Um, There was a really interesting interview, the last one that James Jordan ever gave uh, in June when all the weight was coming down on Michael after that game and after all the uh, scrutiny from the public and, you know, for his error in judgment. And then, you know, it'd come after the year after uh, he had run up large debts in golf and poker um, with a convicted felon. And so, you know, and he said it was a mistake. And so now it was coming back on him again. And James Jordan uh, was talking to us. And I remember this vividly. Uh, He was standing in the rain in a drizzle outside the Berto Center where they practiced. And Michael was not going to be interviewed, which is unusual for him. I mean, there were days during those playoffs where he just, didn't want to talk, but for the most part, he was very accessible. And he sent his dad out and his dad was just so eloquent talking about the magnifying glass that his son was under. And so what he said was, um, Michael feels like if riding to Atlantic City and riding back impeded his performance the next day, then it would have been wrong. But we've sat at his house the night before he had a game and watched movies until 3.30 in the morning. He's up late all the time. He has a lot of energy. And then talking about whether, you know, the implication that he has a gambling problem, um, James said, you know, it wasn't fair. He said he's a competitor. Losing 10000 to him would be like me losing 10 cents. If he was playing for matchsticks or straws, he'd have the same level of competition. He certainly doesn't have a gambling problem. He wouldn't be doing that if he couldn't afford it. He isn't that stupid. He has a competition problem. 
He was born with that. And if he didn't have a competition problem, you guys wouldn't be writing about him. The person he tries to outdo most of the time is himself. Um, and later, Michael said, yeah, you know, it was more than I wanted to lose, you know, the, the money that he lost the year before. Um, and, you know, the thing that, that his teammates knew about him and we knew about him, uh, there was one sports writer in Chicago who used to uh, gamble with them. He used to play poker on the plane. And he was famous for taking everyone's money. And he would play, you know, B.J. Armstrong later said, the reason that we practiced so long and the reason we were on the plane sometimes delayed for hours, it wasn't that we were delayed, it's that Michael wouldn't get up from the poker table because he <laughs> wouldn't ever quit until he lost, and until he won rather. So, you know, if you know that kind of guy, it's like, that's why he played, you know, 72 holes of golf. And that's why he insisted on practicing and scrimmaging over and over and over, you know, until he won. So I think that explained kind of as a little bit of an insight into, you know, his dad saying he's a competition problem, not a gambling problem. Um, but I guess they both go hand in hand. Very interesting stuff. I remember hearing uh, her, his dad saying that at the time. And then I remember during the finals, leading up to the finals, Jordan was still mad about it because he was he had an interview with Ahmad Rashad. Yes. And he, he said, quote, it was unfair that I was being considered a criminal for doing something that's not illegal. End quote, right. Jordan, you know, right. I just, and I think you're right over the years, I think his, his gambling people are starting to make a, a bigger deal about it, but just being gamblers ourselves and into, into sports betting, I just find it so fascinating about, you know, one of the biggest competitors we've ever seen in sports. And of course he's also, you know, into gambling. It, it makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, um, you know, to this day, I mean, he's, he, there was an interview on, on Friday with the local Chicago uh, radio station that uh, former Bears quarterback Jim McMahon, who also golfed like mad, um, played golf. You know, in those days, I mean, uh, Jordan was friends with all the star players from other Chicago teams, naturally. And so they would play golf, he and McMahon, and uh, he said, <laughs> McMahon said that he always wanted to up the ante. He said it was usually a hundred dollar NASA. That's about all I could afford at the time playing for the bears. I didn't make a hell of a lot. I had to supplement my income somehow. I won some against Jordan. I lost some, but I remember one time we were playing, we had our hundred dollar NASA going and I've got him down maybe three bets, maybe four bets on the front side. I was playing pretty good that day. I tee my ball up on 10 and before I take a swing. He says, all right, I'll play you on this side for a million. And he was dead serious. I, I, this is McMahon talking. I said, you know, I'd love to because of the way I'm playing right now, but somehow you'd pull it out and then my kids don't go to college. So no, <laughs> I said, you want to keep up with the hundred dollars, the whole, that's fine. I don't even have a million dollars. So um, that was a great story. 670, the score, uh, Dan McNeil show um, had that interview on Friday. That was you know, I, whether he meant it or not, you know, who knows, but that was, that was Michael. That's just, that's just how he was. And you could call it a problem or you could say, you know, that, that, that was the level of competitor that he was, that he always wanted to, to up the ante, you know, as McMahon put it. So Melissa, as you were covering them, obviously on the beat for so many years, um, is there any little like intricate things that you remember just like, you know, being at shoot around, I mean, you know, you're around the team all the time. Was there, we saw that, that thing where, where Rodman was basically, they were running laps and Rodman passing everybody and stuff like that. Were there any little memory things that you'll never forget about, like being at practices every day or talking to them after, you know, or before? Yeah. Shoot well, um, you know, we weren't allowed to see scrimmages. They would close the, the curtain on actual scrimmage. We would watch practice and then we weren't allowed to watch scrimmage, which makes watching the documentary just as fascinating for, for us um, to see. But my memories are more personal. I was pregnant uh, when I covered the Bulls uh, with my first child. And so I saw a side of them, all of them that I had never seen. I had a lot of stories like that. And the one involving Michael is he had just come back and I was about eight months pregnant. And he had just come back and he was playing the last 16, I believe, games of the season. And we were all in, I was exhausted and, and we were in Indiana and 
uh, you're in a big mob and I was standing kind of on the outskirts because I didn't want to get inside that big scrum. I thought I'd faint. <laughs> and he kind of looked through everybody's legs while he's talking. And he goes, Melissa, why are you wearing pumps? Which is so funny to use the expression if you're a man, you know, like <laughs> who says that, you know, I was wearing heels and, and because oddly um, they felt better for my back to wear like a little heel or something. And so, but he noticed stuff like that. Like that was something that he would notice. And it's not, Oh, he had an affinity for women's shoes or anything <laughs> like that. Um, he just, you know, nothing really escaped him. I remember him being very, um, people might think, oh, he's a superstar, so, you know, he was too big for all of us. But he was as accessible as any superstar athlete I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot. Uh, he would answer every last question after games, and I mean every last question, and there'd be a lot of people there. And there would be, you know, the smallest paper from Iowa to the New York Times to you know, paper from another country that just wanted him to say hi to, you know, to Japan or whatever, you know, or he would, he would do that. He would do whatever. He was a very accommodating in that way. And I gave him a lot of credit for that. He knew he wasn't trying to manipulate. I don't think it's just kind of the way he was trained at North Carolina. Um, he had a feel for even during all the controversial times with the gambling he knew when we needed to talk to him. And there was a few beat writers who traveled with him. There's only three of us. And so he made time during that whole controversy to sit aside, set aside some time for us in a little room, just us and him, and answer every last question. So I really respected him. I really did. You know, beat writers are kind of selfish creatures. We just want access. We just want good stuff. We just want good interviews, you know, <laughs> give us that. And we're really happy. And so he gave us that. And, um, and, and he was, you know, I saw his heart for what it was. I thought that he was loved his kids. Um, that was really apparent. And to me, you know, we talked about our kids and we, the talks that we had were, you know, to this day, I mean, much more about our families. I sent him pictures of my kid, my daughter's prom, you know, photos and if I saw him today, he'd say, how's your baby? And I'd say 24, you know, and uh, she's 24 now. So she's good. Um, you know, he still thinks <laughs> of her as a baby. And I still think of, you know, his kids as little kids too. He has little kids now also with his um, wife now, but um, that's, that's kind of the, the little things I, you know, I have memories that maybe no one else would care about, but, but those are the things that I, I remember. That's awesome. Um, yeah, well, speaking of uh, giving great interviews, I think we've already kept you longer than, than we asked. Um, just amazing stuff. We rarely have the opportunity to talk to someone who's had access to Michael Jordan and the Bulls like you have. Um, but real quick, before we let you go, yeah. any, any crazy Rodman stories you could share? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, because I wasn't around the team every day, I, um, I remember a few things. I remember you know, interviewing him once when he burst into tears, he was talking about his family growing up. Uh, I don't remember precisely what he said, but I remember he was just incredibly sensitive. You know, I think he had issues that we'll never ever really understand. You know, I don't think there was any doubt. Um, and so I always was res not resentful. I, I didn't care, but I always felt when he joined the team, like I didn't understand why they let him get away with it. Why Jordan and Pippen seemingly let him and Phil um, get away with, you know, he was suspended like 40 some games of the games he didn't play the first couple of years. And I felt like, what is going on? Like, are they screaming at him behind the scenes that we're not seeing? And then later I understood that they were really brilliant and how they handled them. They knew exactly. It's not to say they didn't yell at him at times, Jordan going to his house and going to, um, you know, when Carmen Electra, Electra was with them and, and getting him out of bed. But for the most part, they really did treat him very gingerly. And that was not like Michael or Scotty, but they knew what they had in him, that he was kind of a genius, you know, in his defensive play, especially in rebounding. And so I, that was the kind of stuff that, uh, that I found out in the documentary. I saw a little of, I mean, I, I just remember, you know, he would not talk after games. He annoyed me so much. He would never talk. And I would beg off being the one to do the Rodman stories because whoever had to cover Rodman had to literally chase him, you know, <laughs> not, walk really fast after him down the hall into his car. 
And I felt like, you know what? I've covered this team long enough. I have a little dignity. I am not chasing him, you know? It's like, <laughs> and so, you know, I'll walk fast, but I am not running, you know? So, um, you know, I, 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 I was sort of annoyed by him for most of his career, but then I, I truly appreciated him later. So, and he was certainly entertaining and fun to watch. That's for sure. I'd pay to watch him run up and down the court. And there's not many players I would say that about. Wow. Just amazing stuff. All right, guys, that was Melissa Isaacson, former Chicago Tribune Bulls beat writer and columnist, author, public speaker, and lecturer at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. Melissa, before we let you go, do you have anything to plug? No, oh, <laughs> thanks. Well, I have a book that's out now. It's called State uh, Team, A Triumph for Transformation about my 1979 high school basketball team. It was one of the first girls teams in Illinois to be able to play for a state championship post Title IX. And we beat Jackie Joyner's, maybe some of your listeners will still remember Jackie Joyner, I hope. Um, we beat her East St. Louis team in the finals. And it's really a coming of age story about the first generation of girls post Title IX and how uh, that experience to be allowed to play competitive sports for the first time just completely changed our lives and changed who we were and who we would become. And it was a really special and powerful book. I, Steve Kerr's name is on the cover um, talking about the book and, and that meant a lot to me. And it's, um, you know, covering the bulls wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have had that experience. And so that was really powerful. And it, it took a long time to get it uh, published just just cause for a lot of reasons, and so I'm really proud of it. And uh, it's called State. And thank you for letting me give it a little plug. It's out. It's on Amazon, and um, and my website's melissaisaacson.com. And the prologue is on my website. If anyone wants to give it a peek and see if it's something that would interest them, very cool. We'll be sure to drop a link in in the the show notes. Once again, guys, that was Melissa Isaacson, former Chicago Bulls beat writer. You guys can follow Melissa on Twitter at MK Isaacson. Melissa, thanks so much for joining us today. Stay safe out there. And we look forward to seeing your spot on The Last Dance. Oh, thank you guys so much. It was really fun. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Melissa. Awesome okay. stuff. All right, guys, that's it for our latest installment of our special pandemic series. Special thanks to our guest, Melissa Isaacson, former Chicago Bulls beat writer. Thanks to my co-host, Brock Landers. And of course, thanks to my guys here at Van Voorhis Films. And as always, good luck, happy handicapping, and may the gambling gods look gracefully down upon you. Thanks for listening, guys. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Don't forget to leave us a review. And please tell all your friends about the Wager Pager podcast. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Wager Pager. Also, if you or a loved one has a gambling addiction, don't be scared to seek help. You can contact the National Council on Problem Gambling at 1-800-522-4700. They're open 24 hours a day, and all calls and text messages are confidential. The Wager Pager podcast is co-hosted by Chris Rogers and Brock Landers, executive produced by Van Voorst Films, edited by Van Voorst Films, co-produced by Chris Rogers and Brock Landers, created by Chris Rogers and Mercedes Barba. Music by The Morose Project, produced and written at San Francisco Music Studios. Logo designed by John Carbonella. All picks are for entertainment purposes only. These plays are not financial advice. <laughs>